field a few years before. Worked, uh, and that you personally know. So think of that person, bring them up in your mind's eye. And then take a moment now and list the characteristics and behaviors of that person. So you can go ahead and write that down in your notes. Feel free to use the group chat as well if you'd like to do that. So list the characteristics and behaviors of that person. Go ahead and list the characteristics and behaviors of that person. Skills here. Uh, so this is an exercise that we call the third person exercise. And oftentimes what you'll find is when you look at that list of characteristics and behaviors, that that is what you aspire to. So this is almost like a nice, neat little snapshot of your ideal self as a manager. This is how you would like others to experience you. So sometimes when we say we'd like to build our leadership skills or be a better manager, that can be a vague term. So it can be helpful to look back to the goals that you set yourself a couple of minutes ago and look at this list of characteristics and ask yourself, might I like to make any amendments or addition, any additions to my goals? Uh, it can provide a really helpful customization to your goals. Uh, so taking a moment now just to review your list and note any amendments to your goals for the program. Uh, and I encourage you also to keep that, keep that list handy. Uh, I've had uh, coaching clients put it on a post-it <laughs> on their computer as a reminder, as a touchstone, if you will. This is how I would like to show up as a manager. This is how I want to show up. This is how I want other people to experience me. Uh, I, I teach uh, on the topic of authentic leadership and sometimes it can be this, you know, struggle of, well, well, you know, who am I? And who am I as my most authentic self? And I think about it in the frame of your ideal future self. That's your North Star. That's a filter and a lens for how you show up and the decisions that you make. So having this lens of the third person, uh, that person you really admire, usually gives you an insider uh, glimpse into this is how you would like to show up ideally as a manager. Okay. So we've got our introductory pieces here. Uh, our agenda uh, for this first session, just a few key points, uh, topics that we're going to, to hit on here. We've already checked off the first item on the agenda, your goals for the program. We're going to spend some time on the new manager transition. Uh, that has its own challenges and opportunities, and we're going to break those down in some detail. Uh, then the topic of strength. So many of you mentioned you know, how to motivate other people in your goals, you know, how to build that trust as a team. Strengths is a fantastic tool in your tool belt to do that. And we'll explore strengths and why they are important uh, to you as a new manager. Many of you also mentioned motivation. So how to motivate other others at, that gets results. Okay, so the new manager transition. Uh, ahead of today, you had the recommended pre-read, uh, Becoming the Boss by Linda Hill. If you haven't read that yet, no problem. Uh, we're going to give a little bit of a, a snapshot here of some of the key points. Uh, if this is of interest to you, I encourage you to check that article out, uh, which is available on the O'Reilly Safari platform. And I remember reading this article and thinking, uh, wow, I wished I'd read this article before I started managing because it really, it really would have helped me because uh, I fully lived all of the myths that you see in the left hand side of the table here uh, when I first started out as a new manager. And I remember thinking, I want to be a manager because I want to have the freedom to implement all of my great ideas. And of course, they were all great ideas. And I thought that once I became a manager, that that would be possible. Uh, but then I realized uh, just how interdependent the work actually is. Uh, a colleague of mine uh, used to joke that he had neither, as a manager, he had neither carrot nor stick. All he had was a wet noodle <laughs> to try <laughs> and motivate others. Uh, so definitely that reality hit me whenever I became a new manager. Uh, the source of power, uh, the sense of, okay, I'll finally be on top of the ladder, uh, wherever, that, wherever that ladder is. Uh, well, no, you have to earn it. Uh, that, you know, oftentimes, you know, it, it depends on the kind of manager that your team had before. People in general are wary. Uh, they're going to take some time to see, okay, how do you show up as a manager? Uh, does this person, you know, earn my respect? You know, will I, 
will I cede some authority to them? Will I, will I follow them uh, where, where, where they're telling us they, they, they would like to go? The desired outcome. Uh, this one has been a fascinating topic for me for over a decade at this point. This whole issue of compliance and control. So this sense as a manager that I must get compliance uh, and really shifting that to understanding just because I'm getting compliance doesn't mean that people are committed. And particularly with knowledge work, particularly with uh, so much work now being either fully remote or at least hybrid, uh, how do you get the best out of people? You don't get it through compliance. Uh, you get head nodding, uh, you get box checking, you get the bare minimum with compliance, but you don't get the real commitment. And later on uh, in the session today, we're going to talk about how to really tap into intrinsic motivation in a way that makes sense for you as a manager and your direct reports. Next up, we have managerial focus. So managing one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, this was a big shift for me. So I thought, okay, as a manager, I need to build relationships with each person. What I didn't get was, yes, I have to do that. And I need to lead the team. I need to create that culture that will allow the group to fulfill its potential and thinking about the team as its own unique unit and how I can help uh, nurture, scaffold, build the culture, uh, one that is motivational, that will allow the group to fulfill its potential. And then the key challenge, uh, again, naively, I thought that my job was to make sure things run smoothly. That's my job as a manager. And then really noticing this shift to, oh, actually I'm responsible for initiating the changes to enhance the group's performance. That if I lead with how can I help this team perform better, if that could be the primary lens that I use with the work, I would be able to do my job a whole lot, a whole lot better. And that frame was a significant, uh, a significant shift for me at the time. So I'm curious, um, I would love to check in uh, and ask you to reflect on these myths and misconceptions of being the boss and check in on your biggest challenges right now. They might be part of the myths and misconceptions. It might be something entirely different. But take a moment now to reflect uh, in your role or when you think about being a manager, if you're not yet a manager, I, I know that 20% of the group uh, are in that, uh, in that category. What would you say are your one to three biggest challenges right now? What are your one to three biggest challenges right now? And please go ahead and type those into the group chat. We'll take a moment to type those into the chat. Managing with informal authority and the same tools and strategies are helpful. So you're, you're in the right place, NM. Balancing the workload with leading the team. Yes, there's a great saying, you know, put your... The flight attendants tell us, put your oxygen mask on before helping others. Uh, if you're not taking care of your own well-being, uh, your own workload, it's really difficult to lead the team uh, when you're totally stressed out and burnt out. Improving the listening skills, good questions, uh, gaining trust, finding the time to step back. Yes, uh, they are a lot of important urgent items coming at you. And the team culture and planning does take explicit effort and focus. Remote management, uh, managing a group of managers. So you're a manager managing a group of managers. Thank you, LM. Doing the actual ground level work as opposed to managing the team. How the people in the home office, time management, calm skills, process, good kidding. So I hope as you scroll through the chat here, maybe you feel less alone in your challenges, knowing that that's shared by over 100 people here around the world. doesn't matter which country you live and work in. A lot of shared challenges here when it comes, it comes to managing people. As you look at the list, I'm curious, what themes do you see? So take a moment now and just scroll up and down through the list here. What themes are you seeing? If you could just type into the group chat theme and then put a little dash and write what themes you're seeing. So 
So take a, t- take a bit of maybe 10 or 12 other engineers, which is a fundamentally different skill set. A fundamentally different skill set. It's still one of the interesting little idiosyncrasies of our, of our work world. Uh, some more themes here, managing people, managing expectations, communication and feedback, and managing up. Yes, I'm seeing some thumbs up here on the votes. Yes. The setting and managing of expectations. So you can see there are a lot of, quite a few areas of commonality here with the themes. Okay. Yes, motivating people. How do you motivate other people? We're all different. Not everything, what one thing might motivate me, it doesn't motivate JT at all. Uh, MF might be entirely different. So understanding how do I motivate people? We'll get into that in some detail for sure. And then the remote team, that's becoming uh, an even bigger challenge and opportunity these days in particular. Okay. So you're not alone, folks. Uh, we have shared shared challenges here for sure. So a tool that I found to be really helpful over the years, uh, it's an article from uh, Harvard Business School uh, from HBR. And it's an article entitled Leaders That Get Results. And it talks about different styles. So I'd like to share this, um, share this summary and talk through each of the styles here. And as I talk through each of the styles, uh, Reflect and sort of ask yourself, hmm, I wonder which one of these styles or which one or two of these styles is my go-to style. This is one that, you know, I don't have to think about it a whole lot. This is, this is my natural preference. This is where I tend, I tend to, tend to live. Okay. So on the top level, so top left corner here, we have coercive and this is do what I tell you. EI is emotional intelligence. So these are the emotional intelligence uh, skills that you're really focusing on here. It's that drive for achievement. You're initiating things. You're getting things up and running. And you're you're really uh, managing the self-control side of things. And you can see there's another um, area here for the context within which this particular style works. It works in crisis and in turnaround uh, and with problem employees. So with the problem employees, you might have tried every tool in your tool belt, and at some point, you might have to go to the coercive style. Now, interestingly, in this article um, from Daniel Goleman, uh, again, it's in HBR, Leadership That Gets Results, uh, the research that they did, uh, they researched, I think it was over 4,000 executives from a database of over 20,000 executives worldwide. And what they were doing was they were looking at these styles and looking at their impact on culture and on financial performance. So what they found was with coercive that has the most uh, negative uh, impact on climate. And it is required. If you've got a company that is in severe financial difficulty, the coercive style will be required. Uh, It's a great example years ago of um, a CEO who got the nickname Chainsaw Owl. And he was the guy who came in if a company was in severe difficulty and needed a sharp turnaround, a sharp, quick turnaround. He made all of the decisions that might have been deferred for years, uh, made a lot of cuts. uh, And then uh, somebody else came in to basically heal the organization and take it forward. Uh, Interestingly, I think it was Sunbeam where he came in as that coercive leader. And he liked it there and decided to stay. uh, But he was unsuccessful. Uh, because he was unable to flex to a different style once the turnaround period was coming to an end. So it's interesting to note that uh, what you're looking for here is uh, building skill in all six styles and knowing when which style might be most appropriate to use. So uh, RA is mentioning Twitter. (laughs) Thank you, RA. Uh, Next up, we have authoritative, uh, which is much more come with me. Uh, I think of authoritative... Uh, to be honest, a, a phrase that I think of more so than authoritative is visionary. I think of this as visionary. So it's where you're setting a clear direction. It's where a, a new vision might be needed. 
and you're really building your skills of self-confidence, empathy for how other people uh, see the world, and you're that change catalyst. There's a lot of emotional intelligence skills under the heading of change catalyst. And interestingly, according to the Goldman research, the authoritative style is the most strongly positive on culture and financial performance. Next up, we have affiliative, and the, the mantra or the phase, uh, phrase here would be, people come first. And this is where you lead with empathy, you're building the relationships, communication. Uh, it works when you need to heal rifts. It works when you need to motivate people. It works during stressful circumstances. And I saw folks really flexing uh, this particular style in the early days and the mid days of COVID uh, because people were, uh, I used to say, running around cognitively impaired because the pressure was just extraordinary. Uh, our work and personal lives were thrown up into the air. It's highly uncertain and very ambiguous and uh, very stressful. Uh, I also just am reflecting on the challenges that you noticed. Many of you mentioned that motivating people is a challenge. So the affiliative style here could be a good, good option for you. And in the bottom uh, row here, we have democratic. So this is where you're really reaching out to folks, uh, asking them, okay, what, what do you think? Uh, very collaborative. Uh, you're really focusing on the team uh, and prioritizing the communication. This is when you need to build buy-in or consensus and to get valuable input uh, from your folks. Uh, I used to work in a highly decentralized organization and I worked on the change leadership side of the house and practically all of my work was in the democratic area because we had to get, uh, we had to build buy-in and consensus uh, with a real broad mix of stakeholders. And you just couldn't do that coercively. That, that would just never, never have worked. Uh, pace setting, uh, do as I do and do it now. This also has a negative impact on culture. Uh, it's a drive to achieve where you're wanting to get quick results from a highly motivated and competent team. So a real um, strong pace, if you will. <clears throat> it's interesting to note, thinking about all of these styles, oftentimes a particular industry can favor a style. So pace setting is a great example. In the big consulting companies, uh, you see that pace setting style a lot where you've got the deliverable for the client, you work the you know, the 16 hour days to get done. Uh, there is that drive for results and, and, and quick results. Now, the challenge is it has that negative impact on culture. So when you're pace setting, know that, you know, it's something to be used judiciously as a manager. And then finally, we have coaching uh, where it's you're being more of that uh, coach as manager, manager as coach, focusing on developing other people. Uh, building empathy, uh, showing a great deal of self-awareness, and you're helping individuals improve their performance, and you're really looking towards towards the long term. So it's interesting to note that uh, four of the six styles have a positive impact on culture. And uh, the rank order here, authoritative has the most positive, followed by affiliative, democratic, and then coaching. So interesting just to see the, the rank order there. And Again, according to Goldman's research, the most effective leaders, uh, they don't rely on just one style. They use several styles interchangeably when and as the context uh, demands, as it were. So let's take a moment now. Uh, I asked you to reflect on which style or maybe combination of styles is your go-to styles. So let's take a moment and reflect. These different responses come through here. So JC is asking, would we switch not only on context, but depending on who you're managing? Yes, that's a good point, JC. So for some of your direct reports, it might be more of a coaching approach. For some, you might try the coaching approach and then it's not working and you might need to get to coercive. Uh, that could be that that could be a reality. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Next question. Which style is the biggest stretch for you? So when you look at the six, which one of the six, which one of the six is your biggest stretch?
seeing a theme of coercive, a little bit of pace setting, a little bit of a little bit of democratic. Okay, definitely seeing a theme of course of um, being most challenging here. Okay, uh, I'm just looking into the Q and A here. There are a couple of questions that have come into the Q and A that I want to respond to, and I think they're kind of connected. So uh, the third person exercise that we did earlier uh, shows that we ourselves find a good leader, but how can we recognize that it's also what our team needs? So what does the team need? Um, it's a Good. Uh, actually, I'm going to park it for a moment because when we get to the feedback portion of the session, there's a tool there that can be helpful. So the short answer is asking your team uh, is the shortest distance from A to B. And I have a tool that I'll share during the feedback session uh, later on uh, that I think will be helpful. And then we have another question here. Is it possible that I myself as one style, but maybe people think I'm the opposite. How do I identify? Yes, uh, sometimes we might have a blind spot. Sometimes we think, for example, that we're coming across as uh, coaching, but maybe folks experience it as uh, coercive or, or, or pace setting. We, we, we just don't know. Uh, so it can be helpful to ask. Uh, maybe you share all six styles and maybe through a, a Google form or some sort of survey or just ask folks, depending on the trust level that you have, uh, which style do you think I exhibit most often? Uh, and, and see what they say. Uh, it can be really helpful uh, to reach out either to current direct reports or other direct reports with whom you've worked in the past and find out, do you have a blind spot or is your perception uh, the same as other people's? And is there alignment there? Great question. Thank you. Okay. So, building on this um, concept of styles, uh, I am a massive fan of strengths uh, and using strengths as a manager to help not only lead yourself, uh, but to lead others as well. And I love this this quote. Uh, I've never met an effective leader who wasn't aware of his talents and working to and working to sharpen them. So what we're really looking for here is ideally as a manager, a you know your strengths, b you're working on developing those strengths as a manager, c uh, you know your direct report strengths, and d you're helping them develop their strengths as well. Okay, uh, so. The, the strengths work was really popularized by Don Clifton, uh, a psychologist, a business executive. And this is the work through the Gallup organization. And after uh, his training as a psychologist, Don Clifton was struck by how there were so many textbooks that described what was wrong with people. Uh, so many descriptions with regards to what was wrong with people. And he had a counterintuitive question at the time, which was, hmm, I wonder might what, what, what might happen if we were to think about what is right with people rather, rather than fixating on what is wrong with them. It was very much a, a counterculture question at the time. And some data uh, which the Gallup organization uh, is always building on, always uh, researching, always coming out with, uh, with new data and updates. Uh, some of the recent data here what they found was people who focus on using their strengths are three times as likely to report having an excellent quality of life. So it can be helpful to think back on your resume so far and uh, reflect on those jobs where you felt like you were really thriving, uh, that life was good, and prepare to bet that you were using your strengths a lot in that position. 
Now, compare and contrast that with, again, looking at your resume and those jobs or positions where you felt, where, where you know, just they, they sucked, to be blunt, uh, and life uh, was, 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 um, was challenging as a result. I'm prepared to bet that you were not using your strengths uh, in that particular role. And data also shows that folks who use their strengths are six times as likely to be engaged in their job. So six times as likely to be engaged in their jobs. Uh, I have yet to find somebody who is super happy at work um, and that doesn't bleed positively into their personal life. And I've yet to meet people who are uh, not using their strengths at work. Uh, work is not going well and they're having an excellent quality of life. There is an interdependency here, uh, which I think is pretty universal. Uh, more data, people working in the strength zone uh, typically look forward to going to work. Again, reflect back on your resume and ask yourself, is that the case for you? Uh, tend to have more positive than negative interactions with coworkers. They tend to treat your customers better. That's important. Uh, they more apt to tell their friends that they work for a great organization. They tend to achieve more on a daily basis and tend to have more positive, creative, and innovative moments. So as a manager, you're probably wanting those folks who work for you to look forward to going to work to have more positive and negative interactions with their team members and, uh, and other folks outside of your team or department, treat the customers better, so on and so forth. So strengths are uh, a great tool uh, to help you achieve these outcomes. So let's have a little bit of fun here and uh, go ahead and type yes into the group chat uh, if you always talk to people in elevators, airplanes, grocery stores, and wherever you go. So go ahead and chat yes into the group chat if that is you. <coughs> go ahead and type yes into the chat if there's a recurring pattern of thought, feeling, or behavior that can be productively applied. So a few examples of talent here. Uh, so that previous um, slide we talked about being uh, being, a, a, being an effortless to strike up conversations in airplanes, grocery stores, wherever you go, uh, that's a talent. Uh, thinking in an orderly or timely manner. Uh, seeing patterns in data. Uh, I work with a colleague and we do organizational assessments together. My favorite part is interviewing people and getting a sense of their world and capturing lots of great uh, qualitative data. Uh, usually at the end of this work, we have about 600 pages of data that immediately gives me a brain cramp. Uh, but my colleague is able to print it all out and within three to five hours be able to see all of the patterns and write a first draft of the report, which is usually 90 to 95% there. Uh, just, an, just an incredible, incredible strength. Other folks, uh, your strength might be able be, being able to easily influence others. It might be having that consistently positive outlook on life. Every single person has talent, every single person. So as a manager, uh, you might be wondering, well, how can I discover my strengths? How might I help my direct reports discover theirs? So a few ideas, thoughts here for you to take forward. There are assessments. So I've mentioned the Gallup uh, Clifton Strengths Assessment. I'm certified in that. I use that quite a lot. It's a great tool. Uh, you also have the High Five Test and the VIA, the Values in Action Inventory of Strengths. Uh, the Gallup one, uh, that comes with a fee. The VIA does not, the last time I checked. Uh, I don't think the High Five does either, uh, but always worthwhile to check those out. Google them and find out uh, if uh, that fee structure still applies or not. And then another way, uh, again, no fee, uh, no cost, uh, no dollar or currency cost to uh, finding out what your strengths are, uh, talk to people and ask them, uh, what do they see as your strengths? What do they appreciate most about you? That gives you a really good sense of, okay, this is how other people are seeing me, uh, seeing, me in my, seeing me in my strengths. So you might want to ask your supervisor or manager, maybe your peers, your direct reports, ask all three groups, you'll get a really nice 360 degree perspective of what other people view as your strengths. 
you can also uh, reflect and ask yourself, you know, what, what do I see as, as my strengths? And I have a few, a few prompts here uh, that will help you with that reflection. Uh, and we're going to do this now. So reflect and ask yourself, what do you find easy? What comes really easy to you? It's something you don't have to think about. Uh, it's just oftentimes how you show up when you really feel like you're in that flow state. Uh, what are the ways that you instinctively tend to address problems? And reflecting on the occasions when time seemed to fly, so you're totally in that zone uh, and you're enjoying your work, what were you doing? What were you doing when time seems to, to fly by? Uh, so take a few notes now and type a few highlights into the group chat. So we'll take a few minutes now for a brief strengths reflection exercise. Uh, be sure to take your notes in.